Today we are going to start our adventure into mathematical crystallography. Uh, I'm going to begin with a brief introduction of the structure of interfaces, just to lead into the subject, and then carry on to give you the most general method of conducting uh, vector products. Okay? So irrespective of whether you're dealing with cubic coordinates or orthogonal coordinates, in any crystal system you'd be able to do dot products, etc. Okay? So I'll begin by introducing uh, the structure of interfaces. And what we'll do is we'll take a single crystal. So here's our single crystal. And to create a boundary, we cut it in half. And then we tilt the two halves with respect to each other. So here we've made a cut, and then we've tilted this half with respect to this half. And obviously, when you do the tilting, you're left with some space, right? So this is, uh, this is now empty space. And when we look at a boundary between a crystal, we don't see empty spaces, right? So we've got to fill that up with something. And that something will have uh, the shape of a thin wedge, like this, OK? And the sort of defect which has that shape is, of course, our edge dislocation. You can see this is the extra half plane of the edge dislocation. So if I insert this extra half plane, then I can fill up the space. So you can think of the structure of a boundary as consisting of a set of dislocations, because those dislocations are what give rise to the tilting of the planes on either side of the boundary. And indeed, when you look in the electron microscope, at a boundary, you will be able to see these line defects inside the boundary. Okay, so it's, it's a real model of a grain boundary, that a grain boundary consists of arrays of dislocations. Okay. Right, so from a single crystal, we've created a bicrystal, and we now need to uh, understand, you know, how many of these dislocations will there be as a function of the misorientation between the two crystals. Well, there's a very, very simple geometry. Again, these are the two halves of a, of a crystal. And the misorientation between them is an angle theta about an axis which is poking out of the plane of the board. And that axis is also the line vector of those edge dislocations. And each, each extra half plane introduces a displacement b, the Burgers vector, the magnitude of the Burgers vector over a distance d, which is the spacing of the dislocations. So from simple geometry, you get the relationship between the misorientation, the Burgers vector, and the spacing of the dislocations, that uh, tangent of theta is equal to b over d. So the greater the misorientation, the smaller will be the spacing of the dislocations. And eventually, you'll get to a point where these dislocations are so close to each other that you can't really regard them as dislocations, their, their cores are beginning to overlap. Yeah? There is, of course, an energetic advantage in dislocations lying on top of each other, because effectively, the strain field of these dislocations only extend to a distance uh, approximately equal to d. Whereas if this was an isolated dislocation in an infinite crystal, its strain field would extend to infinity. Yeah? So the reason why uh, they might arrange into these arrays is that you reduce the strain energy. So we now have a model for a grain boundary. And you may be familiar with expressions for the energy per unit length of a dislocation. right? So if you know the energy per unit length of a dislocation, and you know how many dislocations there are in your boundary, you can work out the interfacial energy per unit area. right? So this is exactly what uh, Reed and Shockley did many, many years ago. They plotted the energy per unit area of that particular model against the misorientation theta and obtained a curve which looks like this. Notice that here the energy starts, uh, starts not to increase very rapidly because now the dislocations are getting very close to each other. Okay? And the physical significance of this, read, uh, this model breaks down beyond about 15 degrees because you are beginning to get the cores of dislocation overlapping. So this is how the interfacial energy varies with misorientation. 
But when you do experimental measurements, this is what you get. You get sudden massive drops in the interfacial energy at particular values of the misorientation. Any ideas why? Why, for example, is this much, much lower than this? Not only that, if you measure the diffusion coefficient of the boundary, it also shows a sudden drop in the diffusion coefficient. Big, small, big, orange mark, small. It's wide. The kind of drop occurs. Yeah. What, what do you mean? Uh, say it again. Small, small part. Yeah. Uh, will feed each other. To yeah. Green. Yeah. So, so w w what's happening is that at particular values of theta, you suddenly get the two crystals matching each other in local regions. Okay. Now, to illustrate this, we'll take the two crystals with a common origin, okay, and we'll rotate them. Uh, we, we'll take them with a common origin, let them fill all space, okay, interpenetrate and fill all space so that we can identify where the lattice points from the two crystals are in exactly the same position as a function of misorientation, right? So that's quite uh, um, difficult to imagine. So here's a, here's a little movie. What we have here is a, a two-dimensional two crystal, okay, and I'm going to slice it in the plane of the board so that I get two crystals. And then I'll rotate one crystal relative to the other. Okay, and we'll see whether we get those special orientations where suddenly there is a high level of fit. Okay, so this is just a hexagonal crystal. I'm going to slice it parallel to the plane and rotate one with respect to the other. And what you'll, what you'll see is some beautiful patterns appearing. Okay. Okay, so here's, here's one misorientation. And you can see that there's a point which is exactly in coincidence between the two crystals. There's another one, another one there, there, and so on. And they're forming a pattern, all right? So these points we call coincidence points. And the pattern of points is called the coincidence site lattice because it actually forms a lattice as well. If I change the misorientation, Yeah, now, now we have a much higher density of coincidence points. You can see there's a, there's a very small unit cell of coincidence lattice points, okay? So at various different misorientations, you get different coincidence site lattices where suddenly you regain quite a lot of the matching between the two crystals. And if you have matching, then you have less free volume inside your boundary and therefore properties like diffusion coefficients and so forth suddenly show a drop. Okay. Now, we'll do this uh, in much more detail right at the end of the course, where we'll be able to work out the degree of coincidence between the two crystals and so forth. But this is the general idea that you take the two crystals with a common origin and allow them to interpenetrate and fill all space. And at some orientations, you will get good matching between the two crystals, and then you get a sudden drop in interfacial energy at these coincidence site lattices. Everyone happy with that? So this is called a CSL, a coincidence site lattice. And supposing that one in three of the lattice points between the two crystals are in perfect match, then you say that the sigma value is three, capital sigma, okay? Sigma value equals three if one third of the points are in coincidence. And if you go to your scanning electron microscope and do EBSD, yeah, some of the computer programs will allow you to work out an approximate sigma value between adjacent grains. Have you come across that? Yeah? So that's exactly what we are talking about, is if you are close to a low sigma number, that means you have a low interfacial energy. But as soon as you get to beyond you know, about 11 or so, sigma equals 11, it becomes a little bit meaningless because very few lattice points are actually in coincidence, okay? So it's the low sigma values which are the uh, low energy values as well. Okay, 
Uh, this is just another slide showing the two crystals and the white white points here are called the coincidence side points and we have a unit cell describing the pattern of the coincidence points and sigma is the reciprocal density of coincidence sites this is a, a real measurement of interfacial energy as a function of misorientation and you can see quite dramatic drops in interfacial energy sorry the scale is missing here okay but you can see there's quite dramatic drops in interfacial energy at sigma 3 where one third of the lattice points are in coincidence between the two lattices sigma 11 where one eleventh of the lattice points are in exact coincidence this is actually for aluminium okay. Right now we are going to begin with uh, we begin with some um, mathematics, and in order to introduce the mathematics, I want to show you another way of working out the coincidence site lattice. All right. So here we have two crystals which are related by a rotation of 180 degrees about the 112 axis. So it's a cubic crystal, yeah, and rotation is 180 degrees about 112. Now, let me ask you a question. What is the stacking sequence of the 111 planes in, in cubic calf? ABC. ABC, 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 right? And what about uh, the basal plane of hexagonal closed back? You know, the 001 plane of HCP, what is the stacking sequence? AB, AB, AB. Now, how do you know this? How do you know that the stacking sequence of 111 planes in cubic F is ABC, ABC? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can look at it, yeah, but supposing I asked you to calculate the stacking sequence of 135 planes. How do you know that the stacking sequence is ABC, ABC? Well, you know, um, the environment here is exactly the same as the environment there, right? Does that give you a hint? So, you know, we, if we start with a lattice point at C and go to a lattice point at C, uh, then the distance divided by the number of planes in between, right? So if you take a lattice vector, which is parallel to 1, 1, 1, and divide by the spacing of the 111 planes, you get the repeat sequence, right? So what is the length of a lattice vector parallel to 111 in cubic F? Start from a lattice point, end at a lattice point in cubic F. What is the length? Yeah. So it's equal to square root of 3 times A because it's the body diagonal, isn't it? Starting from one corner, going to the opposite corner. What is the spacing of the 111 planes? Correct. So it's A over root 3. So if I take root 3A and divide by A over root 3, then I get 3, which is the correct repeat sequence, right? So now I want you to work out the uh, repeat period for 112 planes. <coughs> In exactly the same way, okay, what is the repeat period? for the 112 planes. So 
what is the length of a lattice vector parallel to 112? Uh, no, no. You know, what was the magnitude of the 111 vector? It was root 3a. What will be the magnitude of the 112 vector? It'll be root 6a. Yeah? Because it's 4 plus 1 plus 1. Yeah? Square root, root 6a. And what is the spacing of the 112 planes? a over root 6. So the stacking sequence will be a, b, c, d, e, f, a, b, c, d, e, f. Yeah? So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw that st stacking sequence for one crystal and a rotation of 180 degrees about 112 is exactly the same as reflecting about the 112 plane. So I can draw the second crystal as a reflection of the first. And then we can see whether we get coincidences. Okay? Because we'll make the two crystals penetrate each other, fill all space, and identify coincidences. So here, here it is. So imagine that we have grain A over here, and we've plotted the stacking sequence of the 112 planes A, B, C, D, E, F, A, B, C, D, E, F. And for reference, uh, uh, in order to start the second crystal at the same origin, I'm repeating this crystal over here. Okay, And bear in mind that grain B is a reflection about 112. So notice that here, C, C, B, B, A, A, F, F, yeah? So if I reflect about this 112 plane, then I generate my stacking sequence for grain B. Yep. I can now identify coincidences by comparing the letters here. So let me see now. Uh, here we have a coincidence here, yeah? okay. And if I if I just draw those coincidences out, then you can see that at every three planes, they are in exactly the same position in space. So what is the sigma value? Three, yeah. So a one, uh, if two crystals are rotate, uh, rotated by 180 degrees about the 112 axis in the cubic system, then that is equivalent to a sigma 3 orientation. Because every third layer will be an exact coincidence in space. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so this is just a diagrammatic way of working out the sigma value. We can do this mathematically, and we'll come to that uh, in the last lecture. Okay. Okay. So let's go back now to our elementary uh, vector algebra. So we have this vector u, and if we look at its components along the basis vectors, the basis vectors are labeled a of i and identified with a basis symbol A, then we can write U in terms of the basis vectors here, and its components are uh, U1, U2, and U3 in that coordinate system, right? And we can write that as a row vector here, U1, U2, U3, or of course we can write it as a column vector u1, u2, u3, okay? An economic way of writing a column vector is to use square brackets. Yeah. Now, what is very important is the way in which you write this basis symbol, because you'll see that the notation I use makes it very, very simple to write equations, very long equations, without mixing up the reference coordinates, right? As we progress in the course, you'll see the advantage of this notation. So when we write a row vector, the basis symbol is on the right-hand side. And when we write a column vector, the basis symbol is on the left-hand side. So the components of the vector u in the basis A are written as u1, u2, u3, uh, alternatively as a column vector with A, u equals u1, u2, a th uh, u3.
Now, here I've got two basis systems, all right? I've got the basis A and the basis B. So the basis B is defined by these particular vectors here, whereas the basis A is as before here. <laughs> and what I want is the coordinates of U in the basis A and in the basis B. So what are the coordinates of U in A? 1, 1, 1. And how about in B? Yeah, 0, 2, 1. Okay. Um, let me see if I've got that. Yeah, 0, 2, 1. Now, this vector is exactly the same as this vector. Right? We haven't done any new physics to that vector. It's still pointing in the same direction, and it still has the same magnitude. All we are doing is referring it to a different coordinate system. In this case, it is the basis B, 0, 2, 1. I'd like to now derive an expression which allows us to convert the components from basis A to B or B to A. In other words, a coordinate transformation. So instead of uh, writing down the components of a general vector U, I'm going to express the basis vectors of A in terms of the basis B. Right? So if I look at A1 over here, then it clearly is equal to B1 plus B2, right? So I can write A1 equals B1 plus B2 and 0, B3. Everyone happy with that? So this is expressing A1 in terms of the basis B. We now look at A2 over here, <coughs> and that's equal to B2, uh, that's right, B2 minus B1. No, minus B1 plus B, sorry, what am I talking about? Yeah, <laughs> okay, M uh, minus B1 plus B2. Yep, so you can see bar 1, 1, and 0. And in this case, of course, there's, there's both identical, A3 and B3. So what, what we've done is we've expressed the basis vectors of A in terms of the basis B. We take these numbers here now and write them as columns of this matrix, so 1, 1, 0 here, bar 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. Uh, so that's basically, all that's doing is expressing these three equations in matrix form, <coughs> okay? Because <coughs> this is a row, if I multiply by column, I will get this, yeah? For example, B1 times 1 plus B2 times 1 plus B3 times 0 is equal to A1. Similarly, B1 times minus 1 plus B2 times 1 plus B3 times 0 is equal to A2. So all we've done is we've expressed these equations in matrix form. And in the process, this is our coordinate transformation matrix. Because now, I can write this as the coordinate transformation matrix which takes a, a vector in the basis A to the basis B. So this is the notation that we are using for a coordinate transformation matrix to alter the basis from A to B. So if I take this matrix, multiply it by any vector U, which is referred to in the basis A, then I will get its components in the basis B. Yeah. Everybody happy with that? So you know, if this is the 1, 3, 5 vector, I simply multiply that matrix by 1, 3, 5, and I get its components in the basis B. I, I can rearrange this equation by taking the transpose of this matrix. So a transpose simply means that the rows in the matrix become columns. Is everyone familiar with the transpose? Yeah? So you know, if, if the row consists of A, B, C, then it becomes a column, A, B, C. Okay? So this is simply rearranging the rows of that matrix into the columns of that matrix. And this is now a row vector, so I multiply row by column to get its components in the basis B. If I want to write this equation, but I want to convert from B to A, then I take the inverse of this matrix. Okay? So AJB is the inverse of BJA. So if I want to do the reverse conversion, 
from the basis B into the basis A, I simply take the inverse of the matrix AJ, B, uh, BJA. So when I reverse the order of the basis symbols, that means I've taken the inverse of the matrix. But notice that in all these equations, the like basis symbols are always adjacent. So you cannot make a mistake. Yeah? If you are given a matrix AJB, you can't by mistake multiply by a vector which is referred to in the A basis. If you, if you, if you accidentally write this as B, you realize it's a mistake. Okay? So in all of these equations, the like basis symbols will come adjacent to each other. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. So we've dealt with a coordinate transformation matrix. And this is, this is completely general now, that if you write those equations that A1 equals you know, something times B1 plus something times B2 plus something times B3, whatever crystal system, yeah, and then express that as a matrix, then you've got your coordinate transformation matrix. Now, in, in metallurgy, what is the meaning of a coordinate transformation matrix? You all have used it at some stage. But you don't call it a coordinate transformation matrix. You call it an orientation relationship. Yeah. So in, in this particular case, <coughs> this is the orientation relationship between, say, austenite here and the body-centered tetragonal cell of some crystal structure. Okay. So this is exactly what is meant by an orientation relationship when you say, you know, 111 gamma is parallel to 011 alpha. That's just a coordinate transformation of the 111 vector into the alpha system. Yeah? Everyone happy with that? Okay, so this is just showing you the meaning of the transpose of the matrix that these these uh, uh, rows become columns. Okay. Now, if if our if our coordinate system <coughs> is orthogonal, that means that the basis vectors are at 90 degrees to each other, then the transpose is also the inverse. Okay. So that's very convenient. So if we are referring to orthogonal coordinate systems, then the transpose is the same as the inverse, and this will be a unit vector, and this will be a unit vector as well. Okay? Yeah, so for orthogonal matrix, the transpose is the same as the inverse. Right, so uh, just, to, just to repeat myself, the way to make a coordinate transformation matrix is to write the basis vectors of, the, of one coordinate system with respect to the other coordinate system. And then just by expressing these equations in matrix form, you obtain your coordinate transformation matrix with the column of this matrix representing the components of the basis vector of A in terms of the basis B. OK, so here's, here's an example that I'd like you to do now. So we've got two coordinate systems with uh, crystal A and B. And the, there's one more axis poking out of the plane of the board in which A and B have parallel 0, 0, 1 directions. So can we write the coordinate transformation matrix for this? How, how can I express, first of all, A1 in terms of the basis B? So A1 is this. It happens that all these are of equal length, OK? So what are the components of A1 in the basis B? Yeah. So A1 is equal to? Is that right? No. So A1 is equal to that minus that. Right? Is that? OK, let me just see. So the component of 
A1 along here will be the dot product here, which is what? <coughs> yeah. So it's 1 over root 2. Yeah. 1 over root 2 over root 2. Yeah. Is everybody happy with that? What about the component of A2? Is, uh, is trivial because that's equal to B3, right? So, what is my coordinate transformation matrix? In column, one over two. Yeah, one over root two. Zero, one over root two, one over root two, zero, and zero, zero, one. So that's our coordinate transformation matrix, where we have expressed, uh, uh, it's not yet the coordinate transformation matrix, this is the components of A1 in the basis B, right? And that's our BJA. So the only difference here with the previous example is that these are now of equal length, whereas in the previous example, A1 and B1 were conveniently chosen to be simple. Okay. Everybody happy with that? Okay. You don't sound very sure, but if you want more explanation, let me know. Okay. Okay. So we've got this matrix now. Uh, and here's a vector u, which, is, uh, which has the components root 2, 2 root 2, and 0. And if I multiply bja by that vector, by, by these components, and notice the like basis symbols are adjacent to each other, then in the basis b, the, the same vector will have components 3, 1, 0. Okay? And I, I, can, I can do that for any vector here. If I multiply by any vector here, I'll be able to get its components in the basis B. Of course, if I multiply this by 1, 0, 0, or 0, 0, 1, then I will recover these equations here. OK? Because look, if I, if I multiply this by 1, 0, 0, then it's half, minus half, and 0. Now, I said to you that a coordinate transformation matrix isn't doing anything to the vector. The vector is still pointing in the same direction and has the same magnitude. So if I, if I work out the magnitude of this vector uh, just by Pythagoras, yeah, because the coordinate transformation, uh, the coordinate system is cubic. You know, all the vectors are of equal length and at 90 degrees to each other. So I can just use Pythagoras to work out the magnitude of this, and it comes to the square of the magnitude comes to 10 times the lattice parameter squared. And if I work out the magnitude here, it should come to exactly the same answer. Yeah. Again, if I uh, just use Pythagoras, so root 2 into a1 squared, 2 root 2 into a2 squared, then again I get exactly the same answer. Yeah. This is with respect to the coordinate system A, and this is with respect to the coordinate system B. So there's nothing here we are doing to the vectors. The vector is still the same quantity, same magnitude, same direction, simply <coughs> referring it to a different coordinate system. And therefore, you cannot have different magnitudes coming out when you calculate them. So the magnitude is unaffected by a coordinate transformation. That, that is obvious, isn't it? 
But it may not be obvious when we do a conversion between the reciprocal lattice and the real lattice, yeah? Because you can even define a coordinate transformation between them. So, you know, if you have a monoclinic crystal and there's a direction there and you want to know which plane normal is parallel to that, then you simply convert its coordinates from the real space to the reciprocal space. And its magnitude must still be the same. Because it's a vector. Yep. Okay. Right, I just want to... Um, revise uh, some elements of vectors again so that you know how to find the components of, vec of a vector in a particular system. So you remember this from the first lecture where this vector u is written as minus 1, 1, right? And this one is written as 2, 1. Now what do we mean when we say the component of a vector in a particular coordinate system? Well, if I take the projection of this vector in other words, I take the dot product of u with a unit vector here, okay? then that will be this distance here. But that doesn't give me the component. It gives me the magnitude of u times cos of the angle. Yeah? But then if I divide by the length of a1, that gives me the component. Yeah? So in this case, So u cos theta, that means the projection of this vector along here, divided by the length of a1, is that clear? So it's how many times I travel along a1 that gives me the component. In this case it's u times cos of uh, this angle divided by a2. Yeah? So that's how we find the component of a vector along a particular coordinate. So this is a unit vector here we had, and this is u cos theta. If I now have a, a lattice vector here, I can find this component along the lattice vector by dividing this by the magnitude of that vector. Okay. So there we go. Right, so we now are going to do something really powerful, okay? We're going to try and see the relationship between a vector u in real space and a vector u in reciprocal space. So just as we wrote the components of the vector in the coordinate systems A and B, we can now write it in the coordinate systems A and A star, where A star refers to the reciprocal basis. Yeah. So here I've written u as the sum of a1, a2, and a3. And similarly, I've written u as the sum of a1 star, a2 star, and a3 star, where a1 star is related to a1, a2, and a3, isn't it? Yeah, what is the relation? What is a1 star equal to? Louder? A2 cross A3 over... A2 cross A3 over A1 dot A2 cross A3, where this is simply the volume of the cell. Yeah. Okay? So, in this case, uh, these these vectors are actually related by equations like that. But there's still nothing different about this vector. Yeah, it's, it's the same vector, it must have the same magnitude in both coordinate systems, and it's pointing in the same direction. Okay? But the components here will be different. Now, if I want to take the dot product of u, okay, it's very easy to do this in when, when you know, the basis vectors are at 90 degrees to each other and it's cubic. Yeah? But if you, if you wanted to do this in an arbitrary coordinate system, it becomes more difficult. But I can write 
the magnitude of u as u dot u, the magnitude of u squared as u dot u. And in one case, I can write u in the real space. And in the other case, I can write it in the reciprocal space. Yeah? So can you tell me what this will give me? <coughs> if I take the dot product between these two, First of all, what's u1 a1 dot u1 star a1 star? Hmm? So, so just, just remember, a1 star is a2 cross a3. One. Uh, it's uh, u1 u1 star. Yeah? What's u1 a1 dotted with this? Zero. And u1 a1 dotted with this is zero. Yeah? So the dot product of this with this vector is u1, u1 star. The dot product of this with this is u2, u2 star, and u3, u3 star. Okay. So this, this is a really powerful result, all right? That the dot product u dot u is basically equal to the components in reciprocal space times the components in real space. Okay? And this doesn't matter which coordinate system you're talking about, whether it's monoclinic, triclinic, whatever. If you know the components of one vector in reciprocal space and another vector in real space, then the dot product is simply given by that row matrix times the column matrix. This is a row and this is a column. Notice again that like symbols are coming adjacent to each other. Are you clear about this? So this is the most general way of taking dot products. And although here I've taken the dot product between u and u, it could be between uh, a vector v and u that you have the same result. If you express one of the vectors in reciprocal space and the other in real space, then it's simply the components of vector v in reciprocal space times the components of the vector in real space, irrespective of the nature of A1, A2, and A3. Okay. But of course, you know, if, if, I've, if I've got two vectors, right, say, say 1, 3, 5, and uh, 1, 1, 1 in cubic F, uh, or, or in a monoclinic system, I've got to express one of them <coughs> in the reciprocal basis to do this. Yeah? If, I, if I don't know what the components of the vector v are in reciprocal space, then I have to work hard to get them, right? Yeah, in general, you won't. So we need a method of finding out what the components of the vector v are in reciprocal space or in real space. Yeah? Now, that's, that's a lot easier than you think. So you remember we wrote the vector u in the real basis and in the reciprocal basis. Yeah. So I want to find u1 star, u2 star, and u3 star. Whoops, a daisy. Yeah. So all I do is I take a dot product of u with a1. All right. So if I take u dot a1, then that's simply equal to u1 star. So u dot a1 is simple if you know its components in the real space. So if it's 1, 3, 5 in real space, and if I take its dot product with A1, that's simply the magnitude of U times the magnitude of A times cos of the angle between them. Yeah? So that immediately gives me U1 star. Similarly, if I take the dot product of this with A2, then I end up with U2 star. And that's 1, 3, 5 dotted with A2, which is magnitude of U times magnitude of A2 times the angle between them. Yeah. And similarly, u3 star. So if I want to find its components in reciprocal space, it's very easy. I, I sequentially, sorry, that should be a3 there. Okay. 
I sequentially take the dot products with the basis vectors in real space and I've got the answers for u1, u2, u3 star. So let's, let's do an example for a hexagonal system, all right? So if we have an hexagonal system, then this angle is 120 degrees, this is A, this is A, yep. And We want to transform the coordinates of this vector into reciprocal space, all right? So what is that vector in real space? Yeah, louder. Well, you know, this is your x-axis, this is your y-axis. What are the components of the red vector in real space? 1, 1, 0. Yeah? So this is... One. And what is its magnitude? A. a. Because it's exactly the same as this, right? So this is A. Now, where will A1 star point? Yeah. So A1 star will be normal to the 1, 0, 0 planes. So it will point along here. And similarly, A2 star will be normal to these planes. And therefore, it will point along here. OK. So we now want to find the components of this vector in, in the reciprocal space. So we follow this rule here, okay? U1 star for this vector, yeah, will be this dotted with this. Okay, so what is what is that? What is 110 dotted with 100? Follow this rule here, U dot A1. So we're calling this vector U. What is u dot 1, 0, 0? You know, just do magnitude of one times magnitude of the other times cos of the angle. So what is it? What's the magnitude of u? Sorry? What is the magnitude of this vector? Don't worry if you get it wrong, just shout loudly, like you're in a discotheque, yeah? What is, what is the magnitude of this? It's written on the board, yeah? <laughs> it's A, isn't it? Yeah? What about the magnitude of this? What's the magnitude of 100? A. And what's the angle here? Uh, 60, 60, it's, it's half of 120, yeah? So, so U1 star is equal to A squared times cos of 60, which is equal to half A squared. Yeah? Just from this equation here. And u2 star will also be the same. And u3 star will be 0 because the c-axis is pointing upwards. Is everyone happy with that? OK, so let me just show you that again. This is now the hexagonal system. <coughs> yeah? And this is our um, real space. And this is the reciprocal space where the A1 star has a magnitude 1 upon the spacing of these planes, and A2 star has magnitude 1 upon the spacing of these planes, right? And this is the vector u. 
and its components in real space are 1, 1, 0. And its components in reciprocal space, we've just demonstrated, is half a squared, half a squared, 0. Now, the magnitude of u has not changed. Okay. So if we, if we write the magnitude of u as u dot u, then it's u components in reciprocal space times the components in real space. So half a squared, half a squared, zero, one, one, zero, which is a squared. Yeah. Which we wrote down here, the magnitude is a, so square root of a squared. So do you see, this is now the hexagonal system, and we've done a dot product in the hexagonal system and proved that the magnitude is correct, whether it's in real space or in reciprocal space. Everybody happy with that? OK, so we, we have a powerful result, which is completely independent of the coordinate system, that if you want to take a dot product between two vectors, you express one in the reciprocal basis and the other one in real basis, and then you simply multiply the row by the column vector, and you've got the dot product. Okay? And it's independent of the nature of the coordinate system. We've also learned how to transform the coordinates of a vector between real and reciprocal basis by taking successive dot products between u a1, u a2, u a3. Yeah. Okay, so we'll continue this in the next lecture. Thank you.